It's September 6th, 2021. This is Rook. If you have binged the excellent new Netflix series, How to Become a Tyrant, you will likely have become enamored of an interesting and idiosyncratic expert imparting profound ideas. That would be Dr. Fatali Mouradem, an Iranian-American academic and writer who's become a popular voice in assessing the psychology of authoritarianism. Why do we gravitate towards dictators? Is the current world sliding back into authoritarianism? And is democracy ever even possible for Iran and Iranians. Fatali Mogadam joins us coming up, plus we have your letters of the week. This is Conversations from, to, and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 142 of Rook Sadocelo Do, Kian. Indeed. Yes, I'm trying to <laughs> yes. help you learn the numbers. Thank you. Sado, I'm Sado quite grateful. Do. Hope you're keeping well wherever you're tuning in from around the world. So, so indignant. You're so angry. <laughs> it's, it's my little joke. Pretty sure my Farsi is better than yours. I, actually, I'm sure are. it's not. <laughs> At this point, I'm sure it's not. <laughs> سلام دوستان عزیز درود امیدوار هستم که خوب و میزون باشین دکتر فتلی مقدم joining us in just a few minutes from uh, Washington DC so he is part of this new Netflix series um, how to become a tyrant and that's uh, how he's become or I guess gotten on the radar of many of us around the world but um, he is such an interesting academic and author I want to ask him about the psychological appeal of authoritarianism about the prospects of ever doing democracy in Iran uh, and how his own story of dual identity growing up in Iran then going to the UK as a kid then going back to Iran around the time of the 1979 revolution and then back to the United States where he's been for the last 30 years teaching at Georgetown uh, how that's informed his perspective looking forward to this Dr. Fatali Mogadam coming up in just a few minutes hello to you the fabulous Kian hi Gian fabulous Kian indeed you see fabulous. Uh, hello Groovy Shaya hi yes. hello Captain Reza hello sir hello sir <laughs> happy Labor Day yes. everybody uh, at least everybody listening in Canada and the United States and I think Australia I'm not sure so in, in in Iran, we would call this what? Ruze Kargaron? Ruze Kargar. Ruze Kargar. Yes. Um, so, it, and it's not on the beginning no, of September, it, right? it's in the middle of spring, like May It's 1st. probably May 1st. Yes. For most of the world, International Workers' Day is May 1st. Uh, like, if that's the case in the UK and much of the world. So it's sort of weird that we do this. I mean, because we're a global program now, we've got to sort of, can't just say Happy Labor Day because it's confusing to some yeah. people. So for us, it's been the first Monday in September since, I think this goes back to the 1890s in Canada. And, and it's kind of also the official end of, the unofficial end mm, of summer. Yeah. You know, you sort of know uh, Labor Day <laughs> means back to school. Oh. It's over with. Yeah. There's no more. I don't know, yeah. tanning. <laughs> and it had its origins in the labor movement and the, the eight-hour day movement. I don't know if you're familiar with the eight-hour day movement, Shia, mm. if that was a thing in Iran. But this is like they advocated for eight hours of work a day. Uh -huh. This is, I mean, before this was regulated, the labor union movement came along and said, okay, eight hours of work a day, eight hours recreation, eight hours rest. That's how a day should be divided. Uh -huh. I mean, people were just being made to work for you know many hours a day etc so um so that's part of where the tradition of labor day uh came from now 
today is Labor Day, but I'm really happy to, to see you guys here. But Keon, you came in with Orate yeah, Talch, uh, you know, complaining <laughs> about, uh, you know, why do I have to do, uh, why do I have to speak to the beautiful people, the, uh, the Rook listeners around the, you know. I mean, Actually, you funny enough, I drive into the parking lot yeah. and it's completely empty and I see a, a Mercedes and I was like, oh, that's Reza. We meet in the <laughs> elevator, we both look at each other like, F my life. We're <laughs> working on a holiday. You know? That's true. Everybody's at the I mean, beach Keon <laughs> waltzes in here for about a, a couple of hours. To, you know, some of us have been here since early morning. Shia was here at 6 a.m. scrubbing the floors. <laughs> you know, uh, Oogie was <laughs> helping out. I mean, people are, you know, people are working. Uh-huh. you got to work. Uh, but I like how Jian takes any opportunity to use a new phrase that he's just learned, like That hasn't been that long. How That's long not a been? new phrase. I've not. <laughs> uh, but I had the anguise uh-huh. to say that. Oh, Jesus see? Christ! I don't even yeah. know what that means. Oh, I know you don't. What does that mean? <laughs> well, see, next time you talk about you know being better at Persian than me. <laughs> but listen, is this really? I mean, what do you have? What what is better than sitting here with your dear friends, Captain Reza? Oh, I don't know the beach, a oh, vineyard. You've got a captain uh, here. Like, what literally do you anything to? else, but the, <laughs> a no, vineyard. It's okay, I love you guys. <laughs> I mean, this is like the, <laughs> the level of Keon. So yeah, well, a vineyard. I mean, I, well, yes, I suppose that would be great. Where do you find well, a vineyard? Okay, question. What would you have been doing if you had the day off today? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd probably be outside, I'd be, mm-hmm. or I'd be reading or something. I know it's okay. it'll be fun, but making but fun I, of me, you're like, oh, a vineyard. We do oh. our shows on oh. Monday. I can't control the yeah. the fact that it's Labor Day, and it's a nice chance to shout out to the workers of the world, <laughs> <laughs> including the slaves that Car Gad, the the, the Ruza Car Gad. Right. Right, there you go. Uh, and and, and now, now Ruza Car Gad in Iran, yeah. if it's May first, I guess. Yes, is that. Uh, is that sanctioned under the? No. I mean, I wouldn't think that the current yeah no it, authorities in Iran would take kindly to uh, striking workers or something. Uh, no, it's not sanctioned, but because it's a good cause to do some protest or a strike or something like that. Usually, it doesn't go well, but <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's not sanctioned. Oh God. <laughs> oh God. So great. it means nothing. It's, it's a, a stunning <laughs> indictment of, for Labor Day. Usually, it doesn't go well, but. <laughs> We celebrate the Labor Day anyway. Uh, <laughs> how is how is Rizik Kargat? Usually it doesn't go well. Uh, uh, it's a com- good day to discuss democracy with us. It is. Hey, here, that's yeah. a good idea. Yeah, mm. I didn't think about that. Uh, and and the, the dictatorship of, yeah, of right. podcasts. <laughs> you will come in and work oh. on Labor Day. The dictator that is Gian. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's right. Why right. do we gravitate, gravitate towards me? Uh, we are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms. If you've not visited the site, uh, the handiwork of Ponta the Artist, check out rookmedia.com. We are on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. We're coming to you on Spotify, on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and CastBox. If you'd like to see some visuals with Rook, switch over to YouTube right now and also on Instagram. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in English and in Farsi, check us out on Telegram. The handle pretty much everywhere is uh, Rook Media. And if you go to our website, you can become a patron of this show and support us. We uh, One of the ways we help keep this thing going is through crowdfunding, and you just press the Support Us button on the front page of our website, rookmedia.com, to become a patron for 5 bucks or 10 bucks a month or more if you can uh, do so. My, I'm craving my mom. Uh, yesterday I was... Um, I was doing a gig. Uh, I was working at something, and and I, but I happened to be up here, up or uh, you know, I live downtown in the city, so I I come up. Uh, I was close to Thornhill, so I dropped by and saw my mom, and she gave me some adas polo, oh, nice. which I did not eat yet. Uh-huh. So I have this container of adas polo, and I'm uh-huh. becoming obsessed with it. You know, that I can't wait to eat it. Did you bring it for the office so Shia could finish it all? I wouldn't dare. (laughs) Because Shia would find it and and, and then I would... What a coincidence. Because last night I was at a friend's house for dinner and then he gave me a Tupperware of Adas Polo and I brought it here for lunch. Maybe it's a tradition for Labor Day. Labor Day. (laughs) That's right. Adas Polo. (laughs) It's Adas Polo Day. Yeah. Yeah. Is it with raisin and uh, She does make it that way, but I don't... um, I'm not that fond of the raisins. So Mm. it's... 
Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, good. I know it's good. I know. Mm-hmm. In fact, I, I I do like that. But mm-hmm. no, she. But it's the lentil and you know and and uh, meat. Well, ad yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and meat. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Oh, see now now see what are you what? thinking about? The workers' food, the, the <laughs> Labor Day food. A shout out to MyTerms.ca, Arash and Anita Fazilipur. They're life partners and business partners, and they are the founders of MyTerms.ca. This is a mortgage company in Ontario, Canada. They have a really good record with MyTerms.ca, focusing on the service aspect of the mortgage business, and they are very well reviewed online. They specialize in multi-million dollar transactions through institutional and private sources and represent a handful of wealthy private investors who focus on one to ten million dollar first or second mortgages. So if you are a builder, a developer, or a mortgage broker looking to team up with a great source, this is the company that you need. Check them out online at myterms.ca or you can give them a call at uh, 1416myterms. Uh, they make it a big priority to give back to the Persian community as well. Arash and Anita Fazalipur, myterms.ca. Thank you. We uh, It's Monday, so we have letters of the week coming yeah. up, right? Yes, we do. Any teasers of what we're going to be talking um, about? Just a lot of good letters. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Kian. Thank you for all the effort <laughs> that you're uh, putting in. She's really not having yeah. it today. It's She's Labor like, Day, so I'm at <laughs> It was really tempting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no. I can't just, wait uh, to hear them. There'll be, some, uh, there'll be some good letters, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we had uh, so Sarah. She's exhausted. Oh <laughs> yeah, let's get this over with. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure the listeners are <laughs> riveted. To me. Uh, will there be any letters? Uh, um, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. yeah. I guess they'll be good. Well, Minimal effort. <laughs> it, it is called um, Ruse Kargar, but it doesn't go very well. <laughs> Let's get to our feature guest. He's probably wondering if he's, he's probably regretting coming on the show if he's on the line right now. Uh, Groovy Shia, Captain Reza, the fabulous Keon. We'll see you with the letters in just a little bit. My feature guest today is an Iranian British psychologist, author, professor of psychology and director of the Interdisciplinary Program in Cognitive Science at Georgetown University. Dr. Fatali Mokadam was born in Iran and moved to England with his family when he was only eight years old. He received his formal education in England, and then he returned to Iran during the revolutionary period of 1979 to do academic work. Indeed, he was researching there during the hostage-taking crisis and the early years of the Iran-Iraq War. Dr. Mokadam who had done a lot of research in an experimental laboratory in England, suddenly found himself in the real-world laboratory of a radical revolution. In 1984, he moved back west and spent a period at McGill in Montreal, where he did research on cultural diversity before joining Georgetown University in 1990. He has conducted experimental and field research in numerous cultural contexts, and published extensively on radicalization, intergroup conflict, human rights, and the psychology of dictatorship and democracy. Dr. Mokadam formulated the staircase to terrorism model, which has been extensively used in international research and practice. His books include The Psychology of Dictatorship, Threat to Democracy, The Psychology of Democracy, and his latest book, Shakespeare and the Experimental Psychologist. And you may be familiar with him most recently for his memorable appearances in the brand new Netflix series, How to Become a Tyrant. But right now, Dr. Fatali Mogadam joins me from Washington, D.C. today. Hello, sir. Hello, and thank you very much. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you. Uh, it's it's a, a great pleasure to get to talk to you. I've been so looking forward to this, and I want to... I want to get into your story. I want to get into uh, what democracy means and what it can mean, not just for the world, but for Iran and Iranians. But I thought I would start on a macro level with something general um, to set the stage for us. One of your maxims that you often repeat, Fatali, is that all major societies began as dictatorships. Now, um, I'm in no position to contest that assertion, but I, I do want to ask why. Why has our first inclination uh, as a species forever been to gravitate towards dictatorship? Um, that's an excellent question to begin with. Um, 
of course, it's major societies that we're talking about. And these major societies came uh, in the last few thousand years. Uh, the current period of uh, weather, the Holocene, uh, which lasts about uh, 11 and a half thousand years, the warming that allowed us to live in larger settlements gradually, begin farming and domestication of animals, and gradually to develop more complicated societies, which initially, if we look back uh, to the uh, Egyptian uh, uh, civilization, to the Chinese civilization, and then later on to the Romans, uh, we see that um, dictatorship was common. That is, one person was given um, great power. And in fact, the, the word dictatorship has its roots in the Roman Republic and the Roman Constitution, where they decided that under times of very great stress, when society was in trouble, they would give uh, incredible power to one person, the dictator, who would get us out of trouble. Uh, but of course, they found that once they gave power to one person, they couldn't get it back. Uh, the one exception in all of this has been, of course, Athens about 2,500 years ago, where uh, the, the roots of democracy began. And um, other than that, in, in most major societies, we've lived in uh, dictatorships. And uh, the key issue here is having a leader that you cannot question you cannot contest uh, and I'm going to come back to that because that is so important in human uh, life being able to ask questions being able to contest the leadership and living to tell the tale afterwards I want to I'm going to ask you about the the psychological appeal of authoritarianism which you've you've talked about and written about but just just one step back in terms of what you're saying uh, and, and I'm sure there's no easy answer to this but why do we gravitate that way I mean we sort of take it for granted. It's not illogical what you were saying. Yes, we, we pick one person, then that person becomes a dictator. But why? Why wasn't the natural instinct psychologically to say, hey, let's the, the 10 of us work together yes. To, yes. to see how we fix this thing? Absolutely. And in hunter-gathering societies, uh, there was shared leadership. There was leadership by women more in some areas. Uh, so it's much more flexible. And you're absolutely right. We need not have taken this path. We have a lot of evidence that collective decision is uh, the norm for many animal groups and in some primitive societies in human groups. What happens is that once there is a surplus in society and once ownership and inheritance and inequalities arise, then the ground is laid for strong centralized leadership. And that strong centralized leadership becomes even more important when groups begin to attack one another because there is something to gain. Uh, there is a surplus that they can try to capture. Uh, when we were hunter-gatherers, there wasn't much use in attacking other groups because they didn't have much we could, we could accumulate. Uh, we could enslave them, but we couldn't do much else. Uh, but once a surplus arose and some societies became quite wealthy, then there was motivation to attack them right. and take over their wealth. And that's where leadership, and particularly aggressive leadership, leadership can, that can defend us, that arises. And of course, once leadership arises, you get stratification and inequalities and ownership and inheritance. These become prominent. So that's a, that's a perfect segue, though, because even with leadership, 
um, there is a way to have or accomplish leadership um, with collective consent, right? Uh, 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 whereas you've talked about the psychological appeal of authoritarianism. If you can break that down for in in um, layperson's terms for yes. me and our audience, what what is the simple appeal of wanting what we would think it's counterintuitive we would think we don't want authoritarianism what is the appeal yes. of it yes uh, the, uh, wonderful question and of course um a number of very important books have been written on this uh, one of them which i first read in farsi actually is escape from freedom uh, from his book escape from freedom he believed that uh, in the modern world because the uh the traditional relationships of family and uh, community have been broken. We have become very anxious and uh, we are anxiety ridden in our modern societies. And we, we are worried when we have this freedom because we don't have the connections to root us. And his idea was mm -hmm. that we, we have a tendency to escape freedom and go into the uh, under the umbrella of the great dictators. Um, I think Fromm was, was correct in many ways, but I think in some ways he doesn't capture 21st century strongmen. When you look at the current situation, I believe it's different. I would make a distinction between two types of freedom. One type of freedom is uh, individualistic, where we have freedom of expression, freedom to move, uh, freedom as individuals to make choices, etc. And we try to actualize ourselves, to optimize ourselves through individual freedom. But the kind of freedom that the strong man offers us is very different. The strong man offers us freedom through the group. It is through the power and glorification of the group. It is making America great again oh, and right. being part of that. Right. It is the Third Reich, which will last a thousand years and the glory of that. So the strong man encourages us to join a movement, join a group, become part of something greater. And of course, it is only the strong man who can lead us only he can save us. Let me, I'll come back to the 21st century uh, element. Uh, and, but, but if I understand you correctly, um, again, it, it seems counterintuitive. You're saying that, I mean, part and parcel of this would be that we don't necessarily, in terms of the appeal, we don't necessarily think that the authoritarian or the dictator is going to be a threat to us. We think it's the, 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 that, in fact, it's the opposite. They're creating a safety. Um, uh, Colonel Gaddafi is going to be my hero who's going to protect me somehow, and, but be a threat to others. This is if I'm in Libya in uh, the 1980s or, and I'm buying into that, right? Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. And also, of course, the authoritarian strongman knows that threat is the key that is why they continually focus on threats. We are going to be attacked. We are being invaded. These Mexicans, these Muslims, these others, they are invading us. And of course, in the Middle East, America is the bogeyman. Israel is the bogeyman. You know, they are attacking. They are invading us. They're taking over our goods. And I am going to protect you. Right. It, uh, it occurs to me that, uh, just parenthetically, that even when we know, I mean, even if we can be a, a, a good student of history and look at these figures and say, um, that was that was bad, that was wrong, that was horrible what happened, that was an atrocity, we remain fascinated by authoritarians, by dictators, by tyrants. We're, we're almost drawn to them, even after we yes. know all about the atrocities they've presided over. I mean, isn't the interest and success of the Netflix series that, that you star in, uh, the recent series, evidence of that? Why are we so keen on hearing about them? That's excellent. I think you're pinpointing a key characteristic of human nature 
the appeal of authoritarianism is not limited to a specific time. It is timeless. And this is what continues. This is what continues to work even in so-called democracies such as the United States. See, what Trump brought to light, and this was a great surprise to many liberals, because they couldn't believe that in an enlightened country such as the United States, there would be 70 odd million people voting for Trump after what he had done, after he had suggested that we inject ourselves with Lysol. Right. This was amazing to them because they couldn't understand how is it that we are being drawn, we are attracted to this man who is ignorant, who is anti-science, who seems to only appeal to our darker nature. And this is exactly the point I want to make, that the appeal of authoritarianism is not new, it is not past, it is forever. It is forever. This is part of our relationship with leadership. We have evolved in societies that were almost always led by strongmen. And most of our history has been under dictatorship. We broke out of that momentarily in Athens 2,500 years ago. That collapsed. We came out of that briefly in some other societies. And we are now in a dangerous situation because the rise of dictatorship is global. Right. So it's not it's not limited to I was this is a, my next question for you was going to be there. I mean, there is a, a general orthodoxy these days amongst, say, political pundits to suggest the world is sliding or maybe regressing back into authoritarianism, not only when we speak of, say, China and Russia, but in the in the West as well. So you believe that to be true? I believe it is true. And if we look at the objective evidence provided by uh, various groups like um, Journalists Without Borders, these groups are providing evidence for us that there is a backsliding here, that democracy is in trouble in Europe, in the United States, in a number of other countries that we usually think of as democratic or more democratic. Now, the question is, why is this? And I believe we have to go back to perceptions of threat. People are seeing themselves under attack in different ways. Mm. They feel threatened. This is partly to do with globalization and the massive movement of populations around the world. Let's take the case of uh, refugees from the Middle East going to Europe. Right. What we saw was that as refugees from Syria, Iraq, other countries, and of course Iran, as they left and went to Europe, anti-immigrant, anti-refugee, anti-outsider sentiment increased, and there was the rise of right-wing nationalism. This perception that we are being inv invaded, that our religion, our culture, our traditions are under attack. Right. And this is exactly the situation in the United States where you have this right-wing radical surge against outsiders in a country of immigrants. It, it particularly gets animated or amplified if there's an economic downturn, right? People are, people are doing without and they're looking for someone to blame. And, um, and so uh, <laughs> the immigrants uh, will be an easy target. Absolutely. In, in psychology, we have a lot of research supporting the idea that frustration can, under certain conditions, lead to aggression. Uh, this was one of uh, Freud's great insights that has been experimentally uh, supported. And of course, the aggression is against others who are dissimilar to us. Right. But, but, you know, back to the appeal of the authoritarian, and, and I mean, we do have, 
in a way, Trump is a gift because it's a contemporary example that we, you know, I mean, we know people and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm careful to say that I, uh, there are people who are listening right now who won't agree that, um, or at least won't agree that, but that Trump is his strongman uh, character is a, was a bad thing, uh, or is a bad thing, and the, um, there are supporters, in other words. But that's kind of the point I want to make, which is that for a lot of people who support someone like Trump, if we use him as an example, maybe this is the case with Putin or other leaders. Uh, of that type. Um, and I know them because some of them are my extended family. You know, yes. they, they're they pretty transparent about him being a strong man. In other words, they're not necessarily saying, oh, he's not authoritarian. They like that about him. They say yes. he's strong. He makes decisions. He's decisive. He puts people in their place. So that appeal is quite vibrant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. And, um, the problem with that is that uh, the Trump types will create a society which is anti-science, which is anti-fact, which in general is not going to allow critical questioning the way it should be. Uh, if we think back to what is the key, what is perhaps the most important difference between a more open democratic society and a more dictatorial closed society? For me, the key difference, the starting point, is the ability of citizens to question and criticize the authorities. Hmm. When you can't question and criticize the authorities, as you can't in many countries right now. What happens is the authorities become corrupt and increasingly so. And that's why in countries like Iran, unfortunately, we have huge, very high levels of corruption right now because the authorities will not be questioned. They know they're safe. If they steal, if they rob, they can't be questioned. Hmm. So this is the key difference. And uh, the authoritarian dictator, unfortunately, has this characteristic that as soon as he, and it's always a he, unfortunately, it's not women, uh, as soon as he comes into power, you get the family, you get the friends, you get the cronies right. around the regime and despotism becomes more and more corrupt. But it is the argument that the Trump supporters would make to say, uh, this is how it, it was not an authoritarian regime. You, you can, Doctor Fatali Mogadam can go uh, on television and say whatever he wants. That wouldn't be true in a true dictatorship. So, how do we respond to that? Uh, well, uh, we respond to that by pointing out that uh, Trump never got the power to shut down your program or other similar programs. If he had the power, I am absolutely sure he would shut them down. Uh, he has, in terms of personality characteristics, he has all the requirements, all the characteristics of a dictator. Um, these characteristics are well known if you study dictators like Putin, Erdogan, and these kinds of people, uh, Khamenei. They have uh, used the front of democracy. They, they, they enforce elections, they construct all kinds of fabricated, uh, very complicated systems to put the front of elections up in democracy, but in the end they make the decisions. Hmm. And so uh, they can't be questioned, they can't be uh, uh, criticized. Um, there's, there's a very simple test for democracy in addition to criticism. Um, I would call it the town square test. The town square test is very simple. Can you go to your local town square, stand up and make a speech against the leader and not be arrested or attacked or killed? Well, yes, you can do that in the United States at the moment, uh, but in many countries you can't. 
including Russia, including Iran, including uh, many other dictatorships. So you mentioned Iran and Khamenei. Let let's let me get into that. You uh, and get into your story as well. But first, I mean, wh- just to situate it, where does the Iran of today fit in? I mean, it almost seems like an absurd question given what we've seen over the last uh, few decades in Iran. But is it what you? would traditionally deem to be an authoritarian society, a dictatorship? Absolutely. Iran is a dictatorship. And unfortunately, uh, because religion is being used to enforce and support that dictatorship, there is an additional layer of corruption, and that is a moral corruption. Uh, You have quite a few uh, of the ulama, of the of the mullahs who oppose this regime in prison and and they've been dealt with that way. And unfortunately, the more democratic characteristics of Shia Islam have always, which have always helped the people, are also being crushed. Uh, Let me give you some examples. In Shia Islam, uh, of course, Muslims are free to choose their marja taqlid, the source of emulation, and they can pay their Islamic taxes, khums or zakat, to any uh, person they wish. They have this freedom to choose. And traditionally, this was a way in which particular mullahs became powerful and could act against authoritarian rule. Mm. Uh, for example, Sistani is still very powerful and outside the orbit of Rome. And one way he's, he's powerful is through Khums Zakat, the Islamic taxes being paid to him. Right. Now, this is uh, the root of a democratic system. You have people choosing who they want to become more powerful by paying them their taxes. But of course, in the current Iranian system, uh, the political mullahs like Khamenei have taken over, have usurped the traditional Shia Islam system of promotion, and they have squashed whatever democratic tendencies there were. Uh, So unfortunately, this has really crushed what could have become uh, a thriving uh, pro-democracy movement within Islam itself, within Shiite Islam in Iran. It could have been part of our reformation. Meaning that uh, Islam is not necessarily antithetical to democracy? I believe there are elements of Shiite Islam, I'm not talking about Sunni Islam, Shiite Islam that are pro-democracy, but they have to be nurtured by the right kinds of people. And unfortunately in Iran, we don't have those people at the moment in power. You you were born in Iran. You grew up on, yes. there until you were eight years old, and your family moved to England. What, um, Fatali? What are, what are your earliest memories of Iran? Are they fond ones? Uh, yes, of course. Most of us have childhood memories that are very fond. And um, I in in seventy nine, I rushed back to Iran because of my uh, fond memories and also my desire to try to be part of a democratic movement in Iran. I drove overland from England to Iran. And when I was driving, I remember there were many of us returning from the West to Iran, very hopeful, euphoric in some ways. And when I arrived, it was a a, a spectacular experience, that opening of 79, when Evan Prison was opened, when uh, we had freedom, and I started teaching immediately in universities. You're talking and, about uh, the first few months post the yes. the, the uh, exile of the Shah, and the, and where things certainly hadn't. Uh, this is pre the co opting of the revolution by the the former the Islamic yes, formalists. Yes, yeah. exactly. And and the universities were were opened up, and women were free to participate fully in activities. They were not forced to have their hijab. Those first six, nine months were euphoric. It was exhilarating. It was fantastic. But 
And sorry, very sorry, soon hang on a the second. Clamp down came. Before you get to that, so you're a kid. So you go to England and you do your university. And uh, I, I'm just curious about. So I mean, you've even at that point, you've spent most of your life in the UK by the time of the revolution. Uh, but you just you see this as a chance to go back to the homeland and and do good. Is that what? Tell me about the the emotions that you had that would lead you to return in 1979. Well, the, the emotions were excitement, um, really feeling inspired by the revolution, uh, but also ignorant and um, uh, ignorant of the true conditions and what was going to happen. Uh, I, I trained as a psychologist doing experimental work. And when I returned to Iran, and started teaching in university, it was there that I started to learn real psychology. Hmm. I, I would say that the laboratory of the revolution taught me so much more than I had ever learned in any classroom. And what did it, how did this proximity to revolution, everything from deposing a monarchy to then the hostage crisis to that co-opting of power I spoke of by the Islamic formalists, then the war with Iraq. How, how did that inform your perspective on the psychology of humans vis-a-vis -vis building a society and any prospect of democracy? Well, first of all, what it taught me is that collective behavior is much more in important than individual behavior. See, in Western psychology, we focus on individuals. All my training was about taking individuals into laboratories and studying them. In Iran, I learned that, no, it's the collective that matters first. And the collective can overpower the individual. Hmm. Uh, let me give you an example of our recent experiences with the pandemic. You remember that at the beginning of the pandemic, the shops ran out of certain goods, toilet paper yes. and all kinds of things, yes. right? Yes. I remember talking with my neighbors and each of us saying, oh, it's so illogical how, you know, people are doing this. Yes. What does the In pandemic have to do with toilet paper? I remember yes. that. Yes. Individually, we can all agree that we did illogical things, but we were pushed by the collective. <laughs> we were overpowered. <laughs> right. And there's a lot of psychological research by Solomon Ash and many others that shows that the majority, the power of the collective can overpower the logical individual. And that's what happened in Iran. Individually, Iranians could rationalize and think democratically, but collectively what happened was there was a push, particularly by the radicals, to go back to authoritarian ways, and that's what won out. But that's what isn't won that out. evidence of of the opposite? I mean, that the, that the collective was broken. I mean, uh, you know, in the end, it wasn't what the majority wanted, right? It was uh, so. Isn't that evidence that a smaller collective within the larger collective uh, took things over? Yes, but at the same time, it shows that the larger collective did not have the skills necessary mm. to maintain an open society. And those skills come with practice, with experience. However, the radical elements, the fundamentalists who wanted to bring about a dictatorship, they brought about changes that ended the possibility of people learning Right. how to behave democratically. Right. Let me come back to that, because that's that's where I want to end off, and it's, it's really important. It's at the crux of what I want to talk to you about. But but just, just reflect, if you can, on those five years from 79 to 84 when you were in Iran. Did, did this, was this a, I mean, I would guess that you, this was, uh, a, a downward spiral of sorts for you if you if you arrived with the excitement of thinking this was going to be the new um, uh, democratic nirvana or people power etc uh, did did it cause you to be jaded was it a, a loss of innocence somehow I'm not sure I became jaded I would say 
I became uh, much better informed about human beings and their behavior, much better informed than if I just stayed doing laboratory research. Uh, also, I became much more focused on long-term changes. Hmm. See, again, Western psychology, most of my studies in Western psychology are one-hour experiments. They're not about long-term processes. So one of the things we have to do to understand ourselves in places like Iran is to look at long-term processes. Hmm. I certainly became uh, much more realistic and, if you like, pessimistic in terms of what the prospects are for achieving an right. open right. Uh, society that is less based on corruption. Now, we, we have to come back to this issue of openness and questioning. See, that the, the challenge in Iran after the revolution was that the fundamentalists who took power they were strong in religious belief. It's the same when you look at 1917 and the Russian Revolution. When Lenin, Stalin, and these people came in, they were not religious, but they had their own religion of mm -hmm. Marxism mm -hmm. and this blind faith to Marxism. Whenever you have a group blindly adhering to a system and unquestioningly following that system, you're going to have a breakdown of democracy. You're going to have closed society. And unfortunately, this is going on in a number of places in the world. Are you always, were you always this measured though? I mean, <laughs> was there not a moment where you just sort of went, oh my God, and, and were heartbroken or broke down? <laughs> oh yes, I, I was certainly heartbroken to have to leave. Well, why did you leave? Well, I left because, uh, believe me, I worked harder in Iran than I've ever worked in my life. I mean, if you look at my publication rate in, in the West, I am a high producer. Yeah. I have published a lot and achieved a lot, but I've never worked as hard as I worked in Iran. But I did not produce anything. And in the end, I realized uh, I was not going to get very far trying to influence things. Hmm. And so I left because I found that my opportunities for influencing life were very, very limited. In the end, I, I even had to resign from university because I realized I couldn't work within that university system. So that, that it was very sad for me to leave because I, uh, you know, I had my mother was alive and living at that time in Iran, and I knew I would not see her often. So it was tragic personally to have to leave. But when when you say you weren't able to produce anything, do you mean you mean write? What 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 were you not able to do? Well, the, publishing was very difficult. Um, if you were trying to publish something progressive. Oh, yes. So that, that was part of the problem. Hmm. Um, and of course, uh, if you're an academic, you want to influence things through teaching, and I couldn't teach anymore, and publishing, and I couldn't publish what I wanted. So that's really why I left, and it, I was heartbroken in that sense. So back to the town square, you were not able to go stand in the town square and say what you want. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, and that's a very difficult situation when uh, that is your mission in life. Yeah, yeah, and, and the reason you've returned to your, your home country. Um, yes, exactly. It's as if they said to you, uh, you're not going to be able to go on air anymore. Right. Well, that would lead you to re-question your life and where you are. You you you've come back to the West. You you spent, uh, I mean, you spent the last few decades as a prominent academic in a prominent institution in the capital of the United States. How how has your 
dual identity, East and West, the, the nexus that is Fath Ali Muqaddam, affected how you see the world? Uh, well, it's, it's affected how I see the world in that um, I see continuity in human behavior across time and across cultures. You know, we're in a multicultural era and everybody likes to celebrate differences. But for me, the key characteristic of human beings is their commonalities and their continuity across time. Uh, and one of these continuities happens to be leadership. Uh, leadership is a key characteristic of all human societies. And in many societies, the leader that is governing is a leader for life. In China, leader for life. In Iran, leader for life. We have a constitution in Iran where the Marja Tahlid is is the 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 main person you are supposed to follow is separate from the um, supreme leader, but the supreme leader is there for life. And in other societies such as Turkey, uh, such as Russia, they still have a sort of constitution, but uh, the leaders. Uh, arrange it so that in every in every uh, uh, election they win. So we have lots of leaders for life. So for me, being an Iranian, living in America, having grown up most of my life in, in, in England, the key theme is continuity of human characteristics across time, across societies. We're essentially the same creatures. We're essentially the same creatures and we, we repeat the same patterns of behavior. See, see, I, I, I love that um, because it's because I think that's the, the, an important part, for example, of an anti-racist message is saying at the end of the day, you know, the continuity, continuity of human characteristics. I, I appreciate that. I preach that. Uh, but I but for the sake of this conversation, <laughs> I mean, you know, there are people who will say. Uh, and and we'll we'll say this with some some cause. I mean, we'll say, uh, Masalan, like the the people of the Middle East do not know how to work together, uh, the yes. way the way the Swedish people do, um, yes. or the Canadians. So uh, so how do we marry that to the the continuity of human characteristics? Well, it's a great question. I would ask you to think about the Iranians. Who are living abroad right now in America, in Europe, in other places. I'm sure you know, and I know, uh, many Iranians who collaborate in excellent ways with others. They do group projects. Uh, I know them in research. I know them in industry. Uh, these people, if they were in Iran, they would not be able to do that. So what is it about? Is it the person or the context? Mm -hmm. I would argue place Iranians in a context where they are supported to be collaborative, to do group work. They become different creatures. What has happened in Iran and a number of other societies is leadership and particularly dictatorial leadership has created a context where there is distrust between individuals, where individuals cannot cooperate with each other and cannot be productive. Right, right. Uh, but I, but I, I'll gently push back. I, I say this with some sadness. Yes, of course, I know some people who work in collectives, et cetera, who are Iranian. But for the most part, I feel like we've migrated a lot of those tendencies. Uh, I mean, if they're not in our DNA, then then we've then we haven't they haven't elapsed in us from the Iranian experience because I do see that mis mistrust in our community. I do see uh, sectarianism in our community. I do see the inability to to get along because we're always looking over our shoulder and what does that guy want you know all of the things that yes i mean so how do we explain that there is some of that within iranian groups but you look at those iranian individuals 
at their work. See, I, I know some scientists, for example, Iranian scientists in places like the NIH and other places mm -hmm. where they're incredibly productive and they don't have any of these characteristics of suspicious, you know, being constantly wary of others. See, when groups of Iranians gather, they reformulate, reconstruct what they had in Iran. They're bringing over part of that culture. Right. But as individuals, when we are put in a different context, we behave differently. So my, my point is that the Iranian context needs to change and it needs a different type of leadership to change it. It's so interesting, too, that um, having trouble uh, with the collective or that dis mistrust, for example, doesn't um, like the, the, there's that. And on the other hand, they're the they or we the Iranians are the kindest people that you will find They're 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 incredibly giving, for example. I mean, there's it. it I guess the, the upshot is that humans are complex, but but yes, but it, yes. but it, you know you it, it isn't like the 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 fact that we might have trouble doing democracy means that I that the, the suggestion would be that everyone's a bad person. It's just um, it's just very hard to organize um, in, in and amongst Iranians, and I feel like in a society like Iran, having listened to you or your lectures and your your work, that has been so colored by dictatorship and authoritarianism, not just in the current context, but yes. through, through the generations, you know, back, back, yes. back, um, before the current one. I, I mean, is it realistic to think that some kind of democracy can even be achieved within a few generations? I believe it's realistic to think that we can move stepwise towards a more open society. We have to remember that uh, at the moment there are no what I call actualized or fully developed democracies. What does Look that mean? The Explain what that means. Uh, actualized democracy means a society where every individual is capable of participating in decision making in a maximum way and it's an ideal situation where everyone has a say and their interests are taken into account. Mm. We don't have that yet. Not in the United States, not even in places like Sweden. However, we have to think of the goal which is to stepwise move closer to an open society and this begins by beginning to ask questions and to have the right to ask questions of authorities. That is the very basic step. The, the, right, the right to ask questions from authorities. Unfortunately, in some societies, that right does not exist. Because if you question the supreme leader or whoever it is, uh, you're in trouble. Right, And of course, if it's a religious system, then questioning the supreme leader means you're questioning God. And that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So we have to go beyond this step. And the first very simple move is to open up questioning. I'm optimistic in the sense that uh, if you look at individual Iranians, there's nothing in their DNA, there's nothing biological, there is nothing set in them that prevents them being productive, democratic, etc. Look at their behavior in institutions in the United States. They are thriving, they are doing brilliantly, and they are productive in ways they could not be in Iran. And the difference is the context it's the same person. I'm the same person who worked really, really hard in Iran from 79 to 84 and produced nothing. I'm the same person. Yet in this context, I can be highly productive. Why? Because the context allows me. The context supports me. 
I assume that's to say that you wouldn't go back to, to work in Iran. Uh, well, um, I would love to go back to work in Iran if if the situation changed. Right. Uh, but I don't think the regime would want me back, and uh, I don't think I would be productive there in, in the current conditions. So just that when you say even Western countries have not achieved actualized democracy, um, so, so is there any example in the world that we can look at, or has there ever been that is a, uh, to steal the American uh, terminology, a shining beacon of democracy? Well, there, there isn't yet, but we have the technology to move forward uh, to much greater participation by people in decision making. Let me give you an example. In, in public planning, city design, in Europe, uh, in the UK, I know, uh, people are given opportunities to give their comments when they want to build a road, when they want to change part of the city, and people can contribute a great deal. We could do the same thing. We have the technology. We have the electronics. Do we want to invade Afghanistan? Hmm. Do we want to invade Iraq? Well, we could have mass participation in this kind of decision making. We need not leave it to one leader. And of course, we know that in most cases, the, these leaders have been making terrible decisions, terrible decisions. So we have the technology. What we need is the willpower to change the current situation. And of course, uh, one of the things we need to do is to change our uh, education system. We need better civic education. Uh, there are lots of people coming out with degrees, but very few of them know much about civics and engagement in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is something we need to change. So we have never in all of human history, uh, in your mind, uh, achieved an actualized democracy, but you're hopeful. <laughs> but, I am, but, I am you extremely hopeful. hopeful. <laughs> um, but we have to keep in mind that this is a long-term process. Remember Cle that... Clearly. Uh, we, yes. I mean, we've got, since the beginning of human history so far. Yes, uh, yeah. yes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, I always uh, remind people that 2,500 years ago in Athens, free men free men, not women, not slaves, had the vote. Hmm. About 2,300 years later, the American Revolution brought a great constitution. And what did it give? It gave the vote to free men, not women, not slaves. Hmm. It took over 2,000 years to repeat what Athens had done. And it took another several hundred years to give the vote to women in 2000, uh, yes, 1920. 1920, yes. And then even now in the United States, voter suppression is so strong that even in the most important elections, barely 50% of the people vote. Voter suppression prevents many minorities and poor people in particular from voting. So, no, we have not reached an actualized or ideal democracy. But I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful, particularly because young people are so promising. I suspected that I would uh, really enjoy this conversation, and I certainly have. I've got to thank you so much, and I hope this is the beginning of, uh, I, ho I hope you'll come back because we just scratched the surface, but it is just so uh, I, I, um, enlightening and, and uh, engaging listening to you. I could do it for hours. Uh, a final question. Thank qu you so much. A, a final question, which I, I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention how to become a tyrant because it's just, uh, it, it's just been released on Netflix, and it seems to be uh, on the tip of everyone's tongue. What's it like to be a, a Netflix star? Um, well, uh, I, I, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not a Netflix star, but um, I enjoyed participating in that program. And I, I 
I think they did a very good job of making it accessible. Uh, I wish they had connected it more to contemporary events in the last 10 years, particularly. Uh, but I hope they will do that in the future. Dr. Fatali Mugaddam, I have very much enjoyed this. I thank you again. Thank you. It's my honor and pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Khoda Hafiz. Khoda Hafiz. Dr. Fatali Mukaddam, an Iranian-British psychologist, author, professor of psychology, and director of the Interdisciplinary Program in Cognitive Science at Georgetown University. His new book is called Shakespeare and the Experimental Psychologist, and you can see him on Netflix right now as part of the series How to Become a Tyrant. Fatali Mukaddam joined us from Washington, D.C. today. Microphones back on for Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, and the fabulous Keon. I love that uh, version of um, of the Rook theme. Is that is that uh, that's Sina Batai? Yes. Yes. Sina Batai on the Santur recorded that for us. That's that's really lovely. Uh, uh, Santur player based in Toronto. Check him out. Sina Batai. Uh, well, uh, that was uh, I could have done that for ten more hours. I really enjoyed speaking to. Dr. Mogadam, um, I mean, uh, there's so much there. I, so, who wants to start? Who? Uh, oh, who, you could have you could have continued that conversation. We would have sat here for another hour listening to him. It was amazing. It was incredible. The way he broke down the 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 psychology behind authoritarianism and 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 dictatorship. It was I'd never never heard that before, and it was fascinating. It makes perfect sense to me too like i actually i never i hadn't seen i hadn't watched how to become a tyrant but you i should. cannot wait oh, to go it's, and yeah, watch it's it it's a very yeah. appealing series i mean it's a very accessible as he says it's very it's made very accessibly it's mm -hmm. easy to watch and and um and done in kind of a very 21st century uh mm -hmm. media kind of way but yeah you're you're absolutely right i mean i what, what was the what was the when you say you, you hadn't thought about this before what, the, the what was a big takeaway for you i'll tell you i'll tell you what the big takeaway was it was when he was talking about how people are running away from democracy right now the ref, the, the, the lack of trust with the democratic con uh, governments and and in fear and threat is where dictatorship and yeah. uh, uh, blossoms essentially yes. mm -hmm. and that's where we are right now this authoritarian leaders use fear as a stick to yes. continue to maintain their retain yes. their power yeah and uh, you could see you could see genuine example of it like nowadays like in our society anti-vaxxers uh, the uh, the the fear of immigrants and it, it this this perpetual like constant concept that we are being attacked by either immigrants or or or, or our own government that is uh, crooked and corrupt, and it very well may be. We don't know, but mm -hmm. just the con the thought of it, that mm -hmm. fear and that mistrust that is being put in 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 our head, is good enough for us to not trust the government. And when there is no trust, we're looking for a savior. And there you go. It was interesting that he was implying, like he he talks about how it's basically scales, like you. There's no actualized democracy in the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. that some countries are closer to it than others. Than others. Uh, obviously, Iran or you know, say Russia would be further away mm -hmm. from achieving it. But he certainly doesn't think that you know the United States or even Canada or anything is an actualized yeah. democracy, as he called it. Shia, uh, what I want to. I mean, it was really interesting and it was very educational. But what I want to point out is that uh, when he said he wasn't able to be productive when he was in Iran, yes, and it's it's really interesting. I mean, being productive matters for him. You know, he 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 doesn't claim that like I have to. I cannot have drink or I cannot he cannot be productive yes, and yes. it's really interesting and yes. it's the problem of I think all the pro producers uh, all the productive mind they cannot work freely in it, was, it was actually interesting how he framed that in, uh, in, in a, maybe it was a 
diplomacy. I'm not sure, but but where some people, I'm sure there are people listening uh, uh, who would prefer him to say that damn regime, you know, or like a, you know, but and and but he framed it in a very personal way. I was heartbroken because uh-huh. I couldn't do what I do. I could I couldn't teach. He couldn't he couldn't be in the town square. The metaphor that he used and speak his mind uh, to to. Um, influence others, or to, or to you know express uh, uh, opine, and and that is an interesting way to put it. Um, that I, ca- I wasn't sure what he at first when he said mm-hmm. I produced nothing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what, what, yeah. what do you? And then it's because his hands are tied, and and you're right. He he's he cares about the work. He cares yes. about what his passion yes. is, and he was unable to do that. Yes. Mm. And and. That the contradistinction of that with, with um, the feelings he had when he returned to Iran in 1979. <laughs> I mean, I, I do appreciate when people are open about this. I know it's difficult for some folks to hear that it, the revolution was exciting at first or, or something like that mm-hmm. because of you know where it ended up. But uh, but when someone's open about that, I, this was exciting. I went back there. I thought we were developing a new society, or yes. you know, mm-hmm. uh, and and. Uh, only to be, you know, uh, disillusioned, or as he says, I was ignorant. I thought that uh, um, I thought that it was something it wasn't. Yeah. Mm, yeah. No, he had a lot of interesting points. One thing that stood out for me is that, you know, he was talking about how there's this like we all agree, like we say, oh, Iranians, you can't trust them, blah blah blah. We're Iranians ourselves, and we say this, but he brought up the point that it's it's not the people it's the environment that creates this d- mistrust and this kind of like mentality so when the iranians come here and you know in north america and they join these organizations there's so much teamwork and they're building and producing and being productive and so it, it's the environment that just creates this like counter like unproductive kind of like mentality and just like you know all these negative emotions towards each other and well you have so to yeah, like, this this point has been made a couple of times mm-hmm. by other people, guests on the show over the last year and a half where you have to you, you can't democracy doesn't just exist you have to learn democracy you have to sure. learn how to work as a collective you have to learn to uh, um, include the opinions of many or, yeah. or, or however or structure it somehow and the, where is the where is the ability to learn that in yeah. contemporary Iran, right? So I thought that was a really good point that he made because I because we do tend to paint the community with one yeah. brush sometimes, yeah. and I, I was kind of doing that in that interview. And he yeah. said, "Well, hang on a second. Mm-hmm. You know, you probably know Iranians who are very uh, who are in the West mm-hmm. or who are you know outside of in the diaspora." who are very familiar with working in a sort yeah. of de- democratic collective. Yeah. Um, and there's probably Iranians in Iran that way too, to be fair. True. But but uh, it's, it's just harder to yeah. do that when you're living in a non-democracy. Right. And I mean, he, he made the point that a true democracy only exists when each person has a say in what actually how the society is built but do you ever i hate to be negative but do you ever imagine such a society i just i cannot it's not in human nature there's always no matter who it is somebody gets a little bit of power they want more they want more they want, no matter how much of a good person they are it's just natural well, it's just I think the way he actually it is so pointed that out too that he said we don't have it we're mm. definitely on the right track towards it are we i don't see it as that a way. in terms of a, in, like on a macro level yeah we're much closer closer to it than we've ever I mean that was his point as a continuum we've Mm -hmm. gotten well now now it's starting starting to roll back a bit because uh, some of the leaders that you support came but (laughs) uh, unbelievable uh, (laughs) but uh, (laughs) no no (laughs) no he I mean you know you you see the uh, Trump clearly there's there's I mean, Trudeau is not too far off. Oh, oh boy. Anyway. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> During an election campaign, no <laughs> less. <laughs> Keon throws the gauntlet down. Okay, back to, back to you, Jean. <laughs> Go on, make your point. A shout out to Arash and Anita Fazalipur, the founders of MyTerms.ca, a successful mortgage company in Ontario, Canada. They believe in educating their clients to understand every aspect of the financing being obtained, and they see each transaction through from the beginning to the end. 
end to make sure that they are closed with ease. If you're looking for a mortgage in the Toronto or greater Ontario region in Canada, go to myterms.ca or 416myterms is the uh, phone number. Uh, they're among the best, and both Arash and Anita make it a priority to give back to the Persian community. Big thanks to them and myterms.ca. Hey, it's Monday. That can only mean one thing, letters of the week. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Reza. Oh, boy. <laughs> Working overtime voice, on Labor Day. <laughs> yeah, I need, like, yeah, take a day off, you know? Let's take it easy. Yeah. Hey. A hardworking person. Yeah, okay. that's sure, sure. In the first. What do you got there in the uh, the letters? Uh, All right. The well, barrel of letters <laughs> over there. Keanu. Well, what was it? A few weeks ago, we had on episode 138, we had a package show called The Directors. We had three different guests. We had legendary director, screenwriter, and producer Bahman Farmanara. Uh, award-winning Kurdish writer and filmmaker Bahman Qobadi and celebrated director and screenwriter Babak Payami. So we had a few people write into that episode. We have a Kastra Manzari wrote, another interesting episode, especially Bahman Qobadi's emotional interview. Good point. That was a beautiful interview. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed that Manzari. one. Kastra Manzari. Mm-hmm. And then Farshid Fathi wrote, Almost the best and the only episode I've listened to two times. It was very different. Well done. Hmm. Nice. Almost the best. Almost the best. <laughs> what was the best, I wonder? Fashid Fatih. Uh, well, we'll find out. Yeah. Well, Please we tell need us. Fashid to write Fatih. back. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, and then as well on episode 139, we had a package show called The Music Legends. We had two different guests, two legendary figures in Iranian music, as a matter of fact. Iranian-American composer, songwriter, and instrumentalist Faramars Aslani. A powerful interview with one of the most prolific and successful contemporary composers and songwriters of our time, Farid Zoland, which was, uh, if, if, for anyone that hasn't listened to that interview, it was really just captivating, emotional, heartbreaking, um, the works. All right, so Bita wrote to us saying, This is so unfair. We love you, Farid Zoland. You're part of the collective consciousness of our nation. My heart goes out to you. Your lyrics are so divine. I'm sure a lot of Persian music lovers who are really successful in America or Europe could easily help our artists. I always wonder why the Iranian community doesn't support each other around the world. Right. <laughs> Good right. question. Um, Hob, and then last week on episode 140, we launched season two of Rook. And uh, for that episode, we had Afghan filmmaker Sahra Karimi on the show. She's the first female chairperson of the Afghan film organization and the first and only woman in Afghanistan who has her PhD in cinema and filmmaking. And only a few weeks ago, she just escaped Afghanistan and the control of the Taliban, yeah. which was really just such a profound story. Um, we have Sepide Homa wrote to us saying, Thank you, Rook, for such a great program. During these difficult days, it's heartwarming that you always have a special show for every single drama related to Iran and Afghanistan. I'm happy that you're back. Sadly, we don't have a show for every single drama related to Iran and Afghanistan. We want to, uh, but thank you, Sepide. I appreciate that. And then Sam Sol wrote to us saying, The free world sold the people of Afghanistan to these animals, and then they left them to fend for themselves. They did the same thing in World War II when in order to appease Hitler, they allowed his army to march into Czechoslovakia. This is a deal with the devil. Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, and then Anahita wrote saying, Thanks for introducing a beautiful and powerful woman from Afghanistan. Thank you for listening. And then Zoya Katuli wrote saying, Welcome back, Jian John. Such an amazing and heartbreaking interview. She is such a brave, talented, and amazing individual who inspires young girls and women. Well done, Jian and Rook team. Thanks, Zoya. And we, we should just once again say this is uh, our episode from last Monday, so episode yes. 140. If you didn't get a chance to hear it with Sahra Karimi, I think that's an interview worth hearing. She is a... Um, she's kind of she's an important voice and 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 it's so of the moment because she's just uh, literally i guess about three weeks ago now uh, escaped kabul and um it's a harrowing story but i think one worth hearing 
I agree. And then Bahare Tufuki wrote saying, she is amazing and very brave. I'm so impressed with her escape story. Mm-hmm. Well, on this Labor Day, it is now time for the letter of the week. Oh. Nami <laughs> Kargar. <laughs> this week's letter of the week goes to a uh, Amy Madani. So uh, it's a he, Amy, A A M I. Ami. Uh, Ami. I don't know. Anyway, he or she emailed us, took the time to email us, and wrote saying, Hello, my dear Rook team. I'm a patron and a huge fan. I haven't missed a single episode. Wow. Mm-hmm. Just stop right there. Yeah. <laughs> That's, That's, it. That's it. I haven't missed an episode. <laughs> have to quiz her. Oh, they go on saying, <laughs> I've also. Him. In- him or her. Him or yeah, her. Well, they, know. him, <laughs> her. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It could Doesn't be matter. anything yes. these days, really. We're fluid. <laughs> um, I've also introduced Rook to a dozen friends, and they too <laughs> have become addicted to the show. I admire Jian's broadcasting skills, his line of questioning, choice of words, and amazing voice very much. Yeah, this letter keeps getting better. <laughs> I'm wondering what happened to the interview with Tara Tiba. Uh oh. And would like to know if inter- <laughs> <laughs> actually it's coming up, right? It it's, is coming yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, we did the interview. We we have done the interview, and uh, but we haven't run it yet, yeah. so we we got to run it in the coming days. Your wish is our command, Amy Madani. Uh, Hope he or she or they go on saying. And would like to know if interviewing Dr. Hulukui, Mohsen Namju, and Hesam Abrishami is in the forecast. Right. Thank you, and Mizun Bashid. Oh, Mizun Bashid. Mm-hmm. There you go. There this go. person really is a, <laughs> a, a, my, a, my, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with uh, um, person Madani. <laughs> Amy. Uh, maybe it's Amy. A, and Amy? maybe it's it's Amy. Uh, Amy. Amy. Yeah. Amy. A A M I. Ami Darim. A M I. So Amy. it's it's probably Amy, Amy. like uh, okay. English Amy, yeah. yeah. Amy Madani. Uh, Mizun Bashin. Amy Jun. Thank you so much for your letter. Uh, and congr- congratulations on the letter of the week. Thank you so much to you, Kion Jun, for uh, pulling those letters and putting that together. Thank you, Captain Reza and Groovy Shaya. Uh, we'll see you guys all on Thursday. This is full time for Rook for today. Remember, for all things Rook, you can go to our website, rookmedia.com and press the Support Us button to become a patron of this program. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together each week. Thoughtful Nagin, the fabulous Keon, Super Patty Saw, Ponta the Artist, Savvy Roham, Producer Susan, Aray Merdad, Sponsorship Sean, Groovy Shia, and Captain Reza. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. Whatever platform you're on right now, it's free on every platform. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Back on Thursday with a new edition of Rook. In the meantime, Mizumbashi. Mizumbashi.